Heather, thank you so much for joining us at Woodside Community Television. You've been the state rep for the towns of Barnard, Pomfret, and Puichi, West Hartford for the past two years. Yeah. Uh, how has that experience been for you so far? Exciting, I would say, first. Uh, also, just a whirlwind. I think there was such a remarkable learning curve for me coming into this process. I, you know, of course, was familiar with how government worked. I studied that in college, but being immersed in it is a completely different experience. But it has been so rewarding having a direct connection to my community and actually being able to bring those cares to the state house in an actionable way. And I've loved that. It's thrilling, really. And you are one of the few legislators who is actually a farmer. You are on the Agriculture Committee. Uh, I assume you're wrapping up operations on the farm as we speak. I am wrapping up operations. We just had our first frost. So our vegetable side is really coming to a close and I'll transition into the dairy side. And I am one of two active farmers who currently sit in the house. My committee is comprised of eight people. Some have farming background and previously had farms, but there are only two of us who are still full on immersed into the work. And that feels really important. <laughs> So that your first year, it was a pandemic year, so you were working remotely for your first year, which I'm sure was challenging. Yeah. Um, your second year, you were more in Montpelier. All in Montpelier, our second year. Yes. And how are you finding the legislative schedule? Because it was originally designed around the farmer's schedule for people like you. Yeah. I mean, for the first few months, from January to like March, it's, it's really okay. It's when my greenhouse seeding schedule starts to be really intense that I'm trying to balance and juggle that dynamic of needing to haul back to the farm and make sure I can water everything and get it all ready. And, and there are late nights in Montpelier, as you know, of course, and that, that is definitely tricky. And then that month of May, that final stretch in the legislature where you're on the house floor sometimes until nine at night, I am trying to plant out my field. That's the opening season. So there are some tricky things to still navigate and maneuver, but I think that's just part of understanding what it is to be a working person in the legislature. We're, you know, a, a people's legislature, and that's what it's like to be a young person navigating two positions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so now it's campaign season. Yes. Uh, we should disclose that I am, in fact, your treasurer. Yes. So I want to make that public disclosure. Great. Um, but you're unopposed, mm -hmm. so you're kind of running against no one, which is yeah. uh, kind of rare, but also, uh, especially as a farmer, must be nice to know yeah. that uh, you don't have a very competitive race and you can focus on the farm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the summer is my busy season for farming. And the first time I was running, I did have two folks that I was running against. And that was really, really brutal, if not more brutal in terms of scheduling, trying to figure out how to make it to all the campaign events, how to get out there in Dornark, how to be present when I'm also running an entire field. So this, this definitely feels a little bit different this election cycle. And I'm able to go at something that is within my rhythm and within my scope and energies and People seem to be really forgiving, knowing that I'm a farmer, knowing how busy I am, and acknowledging where I can put those efforts in. So that feels much more manageable to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your Vermont roots, and yeah. uh, going away to school and having some political experience before coming back Sure. To so I'm originally from Randolph, Vermont. All 18 years of my early <laughs> childhood life I spent there, and I was one of those kids who thought that, okay, once I get into college, I'm not going to come back to Vermont. I don't know what impact I'll be able to have in my small community. And so I went to Smith College and I studied government thinking that I would be a lawyer. That to me was the outlet for the deep desire I had to make impacts and change. And I headed out to California after graduating college and started farming. And that is where I discovered I would have the most impact. And after doing that for a year, I realized that if I was going to farm, I really needed to come back home to Vermont. We have such an amazing agricultural tradition here and it is celebrated and there are so many opportunities. And it was such a shift for me to realize that Vermont had everything that I was looking for. And so I made that move back home at 24. So I've now been back here for seven years and have been farming. And I, it's just been really rewarding to come back home and to feel like this entire 
community has, and Barnard is a little far removed from Randolph, but this entire community has rallied around a young farmer and has wanted somebody who is from here and understands what it is like to grow up here to be back investing that work in. And that's been really neat for me to experience. What do you see or what would you like to see the future of Vermont agriculture look like? I mean, I think my first answer is I want more diversified agriculture. I think I understand the value of dairy and its financial impacts on our state. But what I'm really looking at is our ecological impacts in our state. And I'm looking at how can we make this sustainable, both financially for the farmer, but also for our environment. And to me, that isn't one single avenue of agriculture. We need to have diverse avenues and diverse enterprises. And frankly, we need to start incorporating younger individuals into the field of agriculture. And there's so much within that. That's land access, that's resources, that's financial ability to even get into that field. And so what I am really wanting to do is make farming viable and make it viable in a way that excites people about local food and feeding your community and feeding within your radius. And that is what I really want to see these big shifts taken post pandemic as we start to understand like the impacts of climate change more. That's how I'm hoping it all kind of connect and correlate. And so what, what kinds of things can you do as a legislator to help encourage this, this process of getting more young people into ag and just having a more diversified agricultural sector? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, it's assessing the barriers of why young people aren't getting into farming and why there's this generational gap between folks who are already farming and, and why nobody is really taking it up. And that to me is the resources. There are so many upfront costs to get into agriculture, whether it's equipment based, whether it's land, whether it's accessing like your barns and all the structures or purchasing of things. That is really challenging for somebody who's fresh out of high school, fresh out of college. And so the way we have certain opportunities set up in Vermont is for folks in the trades and agriculture should be considered one of those trades. And so I think our first step would be, how can we set things up that would allow people who want to enter the field of agriculture to have grant opportunities, to have a set fund like set aside for them to tap into in order to pursue that. How can we set up these situations where there are generational farmers who are looking to ease out of it and have this connection with a young farmer who wants to get in it instead of just selling that property off to become commercialized or for development or for housing. I think there needs to be that link because there are people who want to do this work but can't. It's just a really challenging space to enter. I mean, I know I, I don't have my own land. I have to use other folks' land, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned housing, and housing is also obviously a, a big problem in Vermont. There's not a lot of affordable places to live. Yeah. Uh, if there were, are young people wanting to come back and work or farm here, uh, is there any hope on that horizon? I know the state just got a lot of money from the feds. Yeah, with that. there is hope. I know that there are a couple projects that people are looking at. One is the development of new housing in downtown centers. And two, they're also looking at how can we use already existing structures and make them into housing units that are both affordable and obviously modernized. We're including a lot of like weatherization elements when we're looking at new structures. And I think really it's the affordability issue. I think we have to make sure that anything that we are tapping into people will have access to and then on housing there's the whole other issue of there are so many rental properties available in Vermont and we are flooded with Airbnb and Verbo and in what role do we have as legislators to legislate those enterprises as well and how are we going to make it more accessible, especially in rural areas where people have a small property that they're looking to make extra income on, what balance is there within those? So I know those are huge topics that folks are looking at in the legislature right now. My committee specifically, we focus primarily on ag housing and the quality and standards of ag housing, mostly. Assuming you're reelected in your uncontested campaign right. <laughs> uh, and assuming you're back on ag, are, yeah. there, are there specific bills you want to introduce or unfinished business from last year that you want to pick up again? Yes. 
to both of those questions. I think one, last year, I wasn't really certain how much our committee was able to accomplish. A lot of the legislation we were working on was taken into other committees and and really shifted around. And I didn't feel like we had a, a set focus about what our plans were and what our goals were and what we were trying to achieve. And so I'm hoping that with this new legislative session and with new individuals, hopefully in the committee, that we'll be able to hone in and focus what exactly we want to produce as a committee and what we want to structure for that committee. And then in terms of my own legislation, I work fairly closely with Milfa Vermont and rural Vermont. And, you know, as a, as a young queer farmer out here who is clearly very focused on like regenerative practices and small scale farming, I would align myself a lot with the same fights that they're fighting for in there. And something that we're looking at right now is the funding that is funneled into our state for dairy how to make sure that a proportional amount of that is funneled to folks who are pursuing different forms of agriculture and how to make sure that funding is just as accessible. And, and that is like federal funding as well as state funding, how to make sure that that is a proportional amount going to those farmers. And specifically, have you heard of the payment for ecosystem services? Yeah, I think so. Sure. So that's essentially paying farmers for the role they have in mitigating climate change. And the way that the state has parsed that out is saying that anybody who is reducing phosphorus is going to receive these payments for their ecosystem service. And that really cuts out a lot of other farmers that aren't large scale dairy farmers, which totally like they are deserving of getting money to clean that up and to have better practices. But there are a lot of all like farmers out there already who are doing a lot of that climate based work. And I would like to see them get the same amount of funds and get that same credit for the work that they're doing and that they have been doing based on the practices they've been doing for years. Mm -hmm. So that that is a piece of legislation that I'm working on right now. In your first two years in the legislature, how how did you perceive the dynamic between Republicans and Democrats Mm -hmm. compared to what we're seeing across the country? I think first and foremost, there's a fairly congenial element that exists in the Vermont legislature across all parties. I think that, you know, folks typically tend to think that Vermont Republicans and conservatives are a different faction than the current Trump Republicans that I think are really taking over the the far right. I think we really value decorum. I think that there is such a high level of respect for the positions that we all hold and for the work that we're doing for Vermonters that it really puts that bickering or brutality that people have on a on a national scale on, on the back seat and we're so issue focused but I mean in all reality, when it came to personal dynamics, I, I really cut along with a lot of the Republicans. And my committee really had a, a fair number of Republicans on them. And I found myself disagreeing with them on so many levels, but feeling really comfortable in that disagreement because I knew that that wasn't a reflection of our personhood necessarily, that it wasn't going to be something that I couldn't see this human being for the entirety that they were. And I think that that is across the board in Vermont politics, is that we understand that these are people who are just trying to represent the people that are in their areas. And they're carrying forward ideas that people have attached moral weight to. And judging somebody else's morals can be really, really challenging. And the political setting is already so hard on your soul and so hard on your spirit and so to feel like those elements are being attacked it just it does not happen and I think that that will continue and it has continued and I I don't see that really stopping at all yeah I think there's just such a level of respect and understanding that this is really important work and we can't let that get in the way of it and we want to be examples I think too I think Vermont really wants to lead in that dynamic of having an exceptionally liberal legislature and a Republican governor. We seem as a state proud of that. 
which is interesting, but mm -hmm. we seem proud of that. So I can see that carrying forward. <laughs> and yet it has been challenging with when the governor was able to override vetoes, there has been a lot of clashes between yeah. the Republican governor and the Democratic legislature. There has, yeah. And I would say that the dynamic between the governor and the Democratic legislature is definitely a little bit more contentious than perhaps the Republicans in the House and the Democrats in the House. I think that we don't enjoy having legislation that we think is really critical and important vetoed, especially when we know that having a veto-proof majority is really challenging. And that, you know, when you dedicate an entire session to a piece of legislation that you think is really critical, and then having that halted, that, that is obviously going to cause a little bit of agita, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you see as, as shaping up to be some of the, the more contentious issues in the next biennium? Based on what was happening last year, I think housing definitely will be really contentious. I think that folks acknowledge the overall need for housing and affordable housing, but I think the way we're going about it is very different. I think we will have Act 250 battles on development. I think that will always exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will have battles on what affordability means, you know, and taxes. I think that those are always going to be where folks traditionally butt heads and there's always legislation that is coming out about it and those are just heated topics. Um, yeah, those are, those are the big ones for me anyway. I think that those are going to be some big challenges. I mean, we always have legislation come out on, on guns and, and those are pretty brutal. We always have legislation that is attempting to tackle something for social equity and those get really personal and intense and, but I'd be very excited to see what people are putting forward this year. And coming up. On election day, Vermonters will be voting on whether or not the Constitution should be amended. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, on two counts, actually. Yeah, yeah for Prop 5 and Prop 2. And Prop 5, which is Article 22, which is our Reproductive Liberty Amendment, that is essentially making it codified in the Vermont Constitution that regardless of if anybody was trying to change it within state law, that we will have access to reproductive liberty. And that goes beyond abortion care. That is birth control. That is gender affirming care. That is everything built into that. And so this is such a critical piece of legislation. And it takes four years to, to change the Vermont Constitution. And I was lucky to be in there for the last two years of working on that. I also got to make a speech on the House floor about it, which was really probably one of the most powerful moments of my career in there so far. And to speak to how this is an issue that extends beyond women. This is an LGBTQIA issue, and this is huge, but voters will have the opportunity to codify that into the Vermont Constitution. And as it's going with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, this is a really, really critical vote for our state to be making. And Vermont needs to be a safe place for reproductive liberty. You want to talk about the second one? or? Yeah. Okay. And the second one on the ballot, Prop 2, is eliminating slavery from the Vermont Constitution, essentially. We still had a line in there that said that indentured servitude in the cases of, and then it has listed examples, that you are still able to have an indentured servitude. And we are just removing that language from the Constitution and making it completely abolished. So also a really critical and healing piece of legislation that is long overdue mm -hmm. to happen. And less controversial than Prop 5 in some ways. Yeah. But there were some, some nay votes on, on that, weren't there? There were some nay votes on that. Yeah, Maybe. there are always a few folks who are pretty ardent in their no votes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it, they just thought it wasn't necessary. or. I think they're staunch constitutionalists. Yeah. I think they are true believers that this is a, this is a historical artifact and, and we really shouldn't be altering it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I view it more as uh, a reflection of a previous set of morals and times, and we are an evolving species of people, yeah. and we should be shifting things to be appropriate for now. Yeah, I think yeah. institutions should be living documents that can be modified yes. in a very prescribed way yes. from time to time. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So. We're evolving beings, and those articles should evolve to, to meet that. So election day is less than a month away yeah. as we're filming this. Uh, how, how are you feeling? I mean, it's going to be a big day, not just for mm -hmm. Vermont because of all the turnover in the legislature, yeah. uh, but also new representation in Congress and then the rest of the country. Yeah. Uh, a lot could change in the country depending on how certain races go. Mm -hmm. um, and given how the last few years have gone, how, how are you feeling about, you know, Vermont's place in the nation with how things might change? I think I am terrified that nationally there's going to be a flip in the House and the Senate. I think that likely it'll, it'll lend itself towards a conservative majority. And that is really terrifying to me. I think what it excites me is knowing that we could potentially be sending the first woman to Congress, Becca Ballant. And I think knowing her personally and knowing how tenacious she is, how critical it is going to be to have her voice there. And I know that we are a tiny state, but we are a mighty state and we have led on such critical legislation. And I just feel that much more assured to know that her voice likely, hopefully Peter Welch's voice as well, will be dominating forces in a way that will reflect really positively back on Vermont's values and also hopefully be these beacons for folks who are really trying to cling to uh, you know, certain levels of humanity that exist in politics. I think on the state side for Vermont, I am so excited for the turnover. I think, one, we're dealing with institutional loss of knowledge. A lot of the folks who have left have been in there for so long. And that's obviously going to have an impact on folks. But I also think that if we're trying to increase young folks being president of Vermont and active, then having a turnover is really important. And flipping that demographic of who's legislating is going to really reflect the laws that we're putting out. And I'm really excited about that. And knowing that there are so many young women who are running and that is going to shift so many policies from childcare and acknowledging like who has low paying jobs. So I'm excited for those things. Now, I remember from my service in the house that it, it can be challenging as a younger person who has a job on, who has a main job or <laughs> runs a business to be a legislator with the low pay mm -hmm. and the time commitment. Mm -hmm. um, is there an ongoing discussion about either changing the schedule or changing the pay for legislators? Yeah. So, I mean, just from my two years of being in there, I know that there have been legislators, those specifically within the Progressive Party, who have submitted legislator compensation bills, who are looking to be so much more inclusive in that environment, in that space, and acknowledging that we are fairly underpaid for the amount of work that we are doing. And we have to take essentially six months of our lives and, and dedicate it to this. And that can be really challenging for a family who has children and childcare to pay for and, and having to balance all of those factors. And there is definitely, as this new demographic of individuals come into the state house who are facing these challenges, you have to remember that the state house was predominantly folks 60 or over, and they are no longer active parents. They are still active parents, but they're not providing for and having to manage schools and schedules. And, and so it's a little bit less in their purview. And now the folks who are entering this space, it is their current life. And so those conversations are taking a much more dominant role. And I think that's so critical if we're talking about who is going to be able to represent Vermont and how can we make this position more accessible because those are massive factors. I will say that as low paying as this position is, it's still more than I get paid as a farmer. And that is also something to consider when we look at the trades and how we value the trades as well. So there's, I think there's a lot of work that can be done on, on those fronts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talking about low pay as a farmer, it does yeah. seem like farmers, smaller farmers really have so much going against them because the economies of scale in this country yes. um, have have really undervalued good food mm -hmm. in favor of mass-produced stuff that's cheaper to buy. Yes. 
do you think that the more local food Vermont produces, the more affordable it will become for lower and middle, lower middle income people? Because I know it's hard for people who can just get like cheap vegetables at the grocery store. I don't know, to be honest. I think the factors that I would consider in that question is, okay, say somehow all of the food producers in the state of Vermont have a certain percentage that they have to produce for local markets. There are so many factors to consider. Are we setting that price for the farmer so we're making sure that the farmer is getting adequately paid for the product that they're putting out? And then, yeah, I think what I would be concerned about is regardless of having like more food into the market, is that still going to be devaluing the farmer and the farmer's work and what that is worth for the balance of affordability for other individuals. And I think that is the continual struggle that I feel constantly. And if I could just bring it back to like a minor scale within myself and then zoom back out to the grand issue is that we are in Barnard. Barnard is slightly more affluent than Randolph where I grew up. And folks don't necessarily struggle to purchase the produce that I am putting at it at the farm that I am working at. And I know that that price point is not a reasonable price point for the majority of individuals that I grew up with, for the way that I grew up. It just never would have happened. But at the same time, I know the amount of work that has gone into that. I know the amount of care that has gone into that. And I know that that is the only way that I could be economically viable. And so what I'm trying to figure out is this bridge between these two elements of affordability for individuals and a viable life structure for the people who are doing that work and what needs to happen in the middle to make sure that we have, I guess, regional food security with Vermonters feeding Vermonters, but who is stepping in to make sure that that is able to happen on both, on both elements of that. And for me... I think that the state needs to play a role. We put out federally so many farm subsidies for huge farms, for farms that do not necessarily need that for the commodities they are producing. And I don't see why something like that on a smaller scale couldn't be enacted to ensure that farmers are getting a fair price for their product. Local producers have to purchase it in and then making that price available for folks who are in desperate need of adequate nutrition and should have that right to food access. I need there to be a bridge for that because I think both issues are so interconnected and there's no, you can't have one without the other. Right. You need a viable life for farmers and you need people to be able to access healthy food at a, at a affordable rate, but it can't come at the expense of farmers having to also be on food stamps and not have access to health care. And that is a really hard thing. Yeah. Yeah. We might even be forced into the situation of producing more food for ourselves, given what we're seeing with droughts uh, yeah. nationwide and around the world and disruptions. And if there's a disruption in fertilizer and a foreign land, it affects our access to food. So yeah, I, I, I think we need just to encourage as much as we can people to start a little farm, have a CSA. Definitely. Um, we're really grateful for all you guys in Barnard who are doing that. Vermont traditionally has been dominated by dairy farms and the small farm, the small to medium sized dairy farms are in decline with consolidation happening and just larger and larger concentrated animal feeding operations basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this has an environmental consequence but at the same time, there's the same discussion going on about those farmers. The dairy farmers aren't getting enough for their milk because mm -hmm. it's at federal level. And they, without that federal support, they would go under too. Mm -hmm. um, how is Vermont dealing with this problem of trying to fix the water quality issues while also keeping these big farms afloat? So the Dairy Innovation Center, which is fairly new, is tackling that issue head on. And I think the frustration is 
one is specifically agricultural, the other is natural resources. And water quality and agriculture are always going to struggle to come at this issue in a way that they understand each other. Because you have folks on the one hand just trying to get by doing what they have always done, doing what perhaps they can do within their own financial means. And then you have folks coming from the environmental side absolutely acknowledging that the way we are going is not sustainable. This is where I think we need to step out of being like a mandating body or a regulatory body. I think that imposing legislation on farmers without structural supports in place to help them achieve the goals that we're asking them to do is really unfair to farmers. And that's where I think we as a body could be a little bit more conscientious about the way that we're tackling these issues. I think that it's really easy to say, here are the things that are wrong with this specific sect of agriculture. Here's how we know how to fix them. But I think that we need to make sure that we are providing the tools and supports to farmers to actually enact those and put them into place. And not only help them enact that, but demonstrate why this is beneficial to Vermont and its ecosystem as a whole, but equally to their business, perhaps. I think that there has to be financial incentives for a lot of these larger farms in shifting their practices because likely they're already doing things in a way that is the most financially responsible for them, which is why they're doing the practices that they are. Likely it has some kind of cost element involved. And so if we can set up structures in place to help those farmers shift into a way that is much more sustainable in what they're doing, then I think that it's going to make that relationship with the folks who are trying to handle the water quality issues a little bit more collaborative than just coming at them and slapping a fine on them and saying, hey, you are not in compliance with this, and then not giving them the tools they need to in order to shift that. Do you think that Vermont should maybe set limits on how large a farm can become and how many animals are are housed in a certain size of parcel of land? I do. And I think before folks will jump on me for wanting to curb growth and financial expansion for farmers, I think we need to recognize our land base and what capacity we have to sustain operations on that scale. And we need to remember the scale at which Vermont farmers are competing with when it comes to farmers in the West. And we need to really take a hard look at what we are able to produce within the environmental framework that we have already available to us. And I think that caps are critical when you are trying to make sure that agriculture remains viable for a variety of farmers and not just a few farmers who are able to absolve and, and, and take on other other farms. I just think that bigger isn't always better and it definitely isn't in the case of farming and I think that that has been proven time and time again when it comes to environmental impacts and when it comes to the quality of food and product that we're putting out. I think that there needs to be that recognition that farms save rural communities and if those are going under then that is a really brutal blow to our rural economy and we need to remember that. Well, I'm glad that you're up there trying to keep an eye on this and <laughs> steering us in the right direction. So you're running for re-election for Windsor 4. Uh, I'm sure there are folks out there who aren't totally tuned into what's happening in Montpelier, but if someone wants to learn more about you, uh, how can they find your platform online? Yeah, definitely. So I have two websites. I have my my standard campaign website, that is heatherforvermonthouse.com, and that just kind of lists out my entire platform. It has a way to donate. It has a way to email me directly. I also have a link tree for those who are familiar with that platform, and it lists out all of my bills that I have co-sponsored and voted in favor of. It has interviews that I've done with individuals if you want to see more of a dialogue-based understanding of who I am. It has lists of articles that I've written to the paper in favor of topics that I'm interested in. And then I also, on both those platforms, my phone number is listed on there. And then for folks who are not necessarily as savvy in that realm, I am on all the town listservs. And folks can reach out 
through that platform, it's, you know, the most accessible sometimes in rural communities. It can be really challenging to get a hold of folks. And that is a, a really accessible way to just contact me. Come down to the farm. That happens all the time. <laughs> and I am around. Well, Heather, thank you for your service. And thanks for your time today. And good luck on the campaign trail. Thanks so much, Taylor. This has been great.